Hey everybody, welcome to another a very exciting uh, podcast, Unlocking the Secrets to Expanding Human Potential. I've got a great, great guest tonight. Um, I've bugged him for a, a, a bit uh, to try and get him on here and he's kindly accepted and, and this is a big, big, big coup for me because uh, this guy, Matt, is an amazing, amazing mentor. He's got an amazing program called The Man Cave and Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for actually being on here. No worries, Greg. It's awesome to be here with you and all your listeners as well. Thanks for having me. Well, man cave. Yeah. Tell us, tell us. I mean, I've seen it in the newspapers and TV and media and all that kind of stuff. Tell us about what is man cave, how you got into it, why it got started. Let's just right in there. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, well, man cave, I'll start with man cave as an organization, then I'd love to talk about how I got involved in it. Um, we're a preventative mental health charity uh, based in Victoria at the moment, um, quickly expanding um, to Sydney and further beyond. We've got global goals. Believe it or not, when we uh, named the Man Cave many years ago, we did name it the Man Cave Global. Um, so we have big goals from the very beginning. And um, look, the whole program is about how do we help boys before things get too challenging and how do we um, do preventative work with teenage boys and how do we give them the tools and skills to deconstruct the story they might have inherited around masculinity, which then ends up becoming a narrative that maybe they use to police each other in the way that they go through high school. And then that starts to become internalised as a model that they use for how they think they can be as a man in the world. And that just leads to a bunch of um, outcomes that we know are really damaging for themselves, whether it's depression, suicide or anxiety, or even domestic violence. Um, or, you know, dropping out of school, not finding purpose in their lives. And so we really honestly think it's preventative. And so it started 2014 with very simply just holding a space for teenage boys to take off the mask and talk openly in front of each other about what was really going on in their lives and whether it was what's happening at home, what's happening at school, the pressures they're facing. And... Um, the incredible thing about it, and I've seen this with thousands of boys as I've gone through programs and delivered them, is some of it's so simple as well. Some of it's so simple as giving the boys the permission, the space and the tools and the role models um, to talk openly. And after the session, the boys will most often say to us, I had no idea my mates were going through the same challenges I was going through. Um, <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there'll often be boys across this, the room that are connecting over things. And at the start of the day, we can tell, we can tell they're not mates. We can tell they're from different social cliques, but they're, they're yeah. connecting over the same challenges at home or connecting over the same challenges at school. So the man, that's the man cave. That's where it started um, 2014, but now works with 20,000 boys and men across Victoria and Australia. Um, and that's a full day program. That's not just come in and delivering a keynote. That's a full day workshop that sort of takes them through a rite of passage process and um yeah now it's expanding out to uh, man cave tv which is uh there might be a few things that your listeners might need to go google i'm not sure how educated they are in the world of social media um but we're now partnering with movember to um, create a board of boys which will be a board of teenage boys that are there to work with us to do the work and also create content for other teenage boys um, and that will be on TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch, which is a stream, gaming streaming platform. And we're also now building out Man Cave Academy, which is working with adults around Australia, be it teachers, educators, uh, and coaches that want to work with young men more effectively. And um, that's kind of the model as we're growing. So the only other element that's there is also Stuff, which is a personal hygiene brand for uh, men that is all about championing healthy masculinity. Think of it like links, but without the misogyny. And it also is partly owned by Man Cave. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's kind of the model. Um, I can talk to you more about how I got involved in it, but that's who the Man Cave is, yeah. Cool. So what started this idea? I mean, you, you and I um, share share a friend in the workshop that we went to and and, mm -hmm. and, um, and what I've interviewed on here, uh, and, you know, he's a great man and what he does is magnificent. So how... And you said it started back in 2014. And tell us about, you know, how it started from that idea. Mm, yeah. Um, well, 
the, the few guys that started it basically looked at what they didn't have when they're in high school. Now, I don't know what, uh, what your high school experience was like. I think about mine and for anyone that's listening, I'd, I'd say to you first and foremost, if you're not a teenager and not, like and you're an adult, what was life like for you when you were a teenager? And I actually think about that. What was your relationships like? What were your relationships like with your parents? What did you get rewarded for? And what did you get in trouble for? And what were the what were the things you did that you knew would make sure you were safe and you'd get through school? What was that environment like? Now imagine that, but with social media, the global pandemic, political and social um, movement, distrusts, the whole, the whole raft of things that we're seeing last few years. And imagine you're 14 years old again. Yes. And um, where the Man Cave started was really the idea of where how do we give boys the skills and tools to talk openly with each other but also the idea of the man cave was actually i'm, I'm wearing our awesome tracky for those of you that are watching <laughs> on youtube um is the antlers on the side here where we've intentionally chosen because they're sort of an ancient symbol for safety and the idea there is that it's about creating a psychologically safe place where the yep. boys know they can talk about what's really on their mind without getting in trouble. And very early on in the day, we have to remind them we're not their teachers and you're not going to get in trouble if you don't give the right answer. Actually, we just yeah. want you to be honest. And so um, yeah. that's sort of where the inspiration for the idea came from. And I guess one of the things we're really conscious of is that the Man Cave as an organisation doesn't perpetuate what it's trying to change. And so we don't want it to be a vehicle for patriarchy and misogyny and and unhealthy masculinity to continue um but the brand itself is there to really meet boys where they're at so if a yep. boy goes oh we're going to an emotional intelligence workshop tomorrow called the feelings cave i don't think he's coming to school or if he's coming to school he's got his guard up so <laughs> instead we started with the man cave which feels yep. a bit more familiar um they, they're familiar with the concept maybe it's got a few more pool tables and beer fridges than ours does um yep and then the actual experience of the, day, of the of what we do with boys, whether it's in a workshop or um, online, as it has been for the last few years, it's about meeting them where they're at first and foremost and using banter to connect with them. And then uh, introducing ourselves in a way that gives them new role models of what a man can look like and hopefully gives at least one of those, at least every of those boys, uh, they see something of themselves in the one of the facilitators. Um, and, you know, this works really, you mentioned Anna um, Rubenstein, um, just referenced him before, this work was really inspired by his work in trying to get rites of passage back into mainstream. And, um, yeah, that's the other bit we think has really been missing for teenage boys and that's why the program is designed to be a full-day experience as well. And everything we'll do in different ways will be about not just educating a boy but also giving him a safe space in which to transform and grow. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, it was a couple of notes here is that, um, you know, role models and that's what I think is, you know, severely lacking these days is effective role models for, for young boys. Like you mentioned social media, you got mm -hmm. these people that are influencers who aren't role models at all, yet, you know, they've been given this platform to be able to, people to mimic them because they think that's success or that's some, some ways makes you happy is that um, there's a whole disconnect with, with that about role models for, for teenage boys. How do you sort of, mm. you know, get around that and, and help them see what a, what a good role model would be from a masculine perspective? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing uh, we we've always focused on is, making sure that the guys that are walking into the room to hold any work we're doing with a boy, they've done the work on themselves first. Yeah. And a boy can feel that. Anyone can yeah, feel yeah. that. They go, yeah, can oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, looked, he's done the shadow work or he's gone and looked it's at done. the dark part or he's come <laughs> to terms with the things he's ashamed of and he's actually done the work. And, he's um, done the dark part of the soul. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's come back. And he's great. Now he's here and he's, he's sort of reintegrated and he's ready to, to, to teach us. Yep. Um, yep. That's the first thing I think is, 
is that our facilitators do the work. So we'll take them on retreats every year and they'll do the work together. Um, and we'll do training with them then to give them skills. So I think that's yep. the first thing with the role models piece is that. that. And then the second bit is um, they'll tell stories as well. And I think this is a, for, for anyone that wants to be a role model for a boy in their life. They'll tell stories without giving advice and they'll use the story as the vehicle to teach and they won't need to tell the boy at the end. They'll just trust that he's going to take his own thing from it. Um, yep. And they'll ask afterwards, like, what'd you get out of that? And sometimes the boys are like, well, I don't know. I don't really know what that was about. It's like, okay, no worries. Well, let's just, let's just keep moving, moving with it. And they'll, they'll move with what's in the room. So they they won't mm -hmm. ignore, like if there's a boy playing up at the back row and not contributing, then we'll stop the workshop and we'll engage with him openly in front of the group and start to talk about maybe the mask that he's wearing in front of the group. Maybe it's the yeah. joker, maybe it's the smart ass, whatever it is. And then we'll give him the opportunity to, to not wear that mask today and to yeah. be the leader or the smart guy that he actually is. And then we'll enroll the group in saying, yeah, I actually would love to see that from him today. And he then has permission from his mates as well, not just from us. So the, the role model is also the, the enabler of that process. And ideally, the boys don't even realise that we're there at the end of the day. Um, but like the bigger, the bigger picture, I think, with the role models piece as well is the challenge we're seeing with boys, especially now, is they're looking to men in the world that are successful um, full stop, not because yeah. of their characteristics and their attributes, but because of what they've achieved. And yeah. th that does concern us. You know, they're looking at, athletes or entrepreneurs you know elon musk and jeff bezos and um, different football players and some of these characters are great people but that's not necessarily the whole reason why boys are connecting with them um and so the presence of role models in their life is so important and um you know since starting to work at the man cave i've become way more present to the role that i have to play just in the boys that i have around me and and the women as well in yeah um yeah doing my work um, telling stories and holding space as well when it's needed. Um, so yeah. the role models part is a whole space. <laughs> um, yeah. That's how yeah. we try and tackle it. But yeah, I'm sure you would have seen seen a lot of it through your work as well and know the importance of it. Look, it's look, it's it's difficult because like you see, you know, you, you mentioned you know some people there, and Jeff Bezos Scott was having an affair behind his wife's back, right? Mm. Um, not really a role model. <laughs> You know, mm. successful has billions of dollars in his you know, bank account, but as you've seen, his personal life was a shambles. Um, mm. So, as you, you and I know, we probably know some very, very wealthy people that are very, very unhappy. <laughs> right? Mm. You know, money doesn't equal success. So, um, some of the mm. stuff I'm, I'm interested in is especially around the relationship side of things and being able to teach boys how to actually. Um, treat women because when I when I grew up and I was I'm a um, an eighties nineties kid right so I finished year twelve and ninety two so our sex education was Playboy magazines and <laughs> watching yeah. watching pornos right mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. our that was how we were taught to you know connect and you know have intimacy with with women and it's completely wrong and. Mm -hmm. So how do we actually and how do you start teaching boys at a young age to be able to respect women and to have a, how to have the right relationships and actually have communication and um, safety, you know, for their partners? So we actually bring up these boys so when they're in their 20s and 30s that they actually have great values around what a relationship really is and what intimacy mm. actually is between two, two souls and two human beings, not you know, shoving some woman's head into a pillow and, you know, mm. gangbanging mm. her, right? So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, it's important as we go through this conversation with relationships as well that we are talking not just about heterosexual relationships, we're talking right. about all kinds of intimate relationships as well. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a few different ways to answer that. It's a great question. I think the first thing is I think, I think, we forget as adult men what it was like as our, at our age again. And so I'll take you back there from what I'm now seeing <laughs> with a boy. Yeah. I went to an all-boys private school. So it was quite a unique environment in that way. Um, but I know this from working with other boys is first and foremost for a boy right now, 
he's trying to work out how to create, how to get become safe in his group of mates. And so yeah. he's doing things that are going to ensure that his spot in the social hierarchy is, is assured. And yeah. him and his mates are then policing each other according to these rules that they've inherited around this story of masculinity that we yeah. all know is outdated. But, yeah. you know, they've got this story now and, and, and they haven't had anyone to come in and tell them, are you guys aware that you're running this script and it's not working for you? Because yep. realistically, when we do deconstruct the scripts, they go, oh, yeah, I hate having to have pressure to, like, hook up at a party. I just want to have yep. a good time. Um, so the first bit, I think, is to realise that, unfortunately, the way that we're seeing teenage boys in an unhealthy way treating women is because they're seen as a way to, um, whether it's a conquest-seeking behaviour or whether it's, hooking up so that they can then demonstrate their alpha yeah. male status within yeah. a group, then yeah. then that's that's what it's there for. It's not necessarily for them. And this isn't to say that they want it because I think back to when I was that age and I'm doing some deeper personal work at the moment and connecting back with my teenage boy. I'm yeah. like, whoa, like you, you, yeah. like you have some stuff to work through, dude. And um it wasn't that he didn't want to connect with women genuinely. Like, and it's the same now. Boys want to connect really genuinely. It's just the pressure of of, of their mates makes it hard. Um, so that's that'd be the first bit. I think that's con context that's really important. Um, the second bit is how their relationship is with themselves, and um, what what we try and talk about with boys is we're not making masculinity wrong in any of this work. And I think this is relevant for you and me and any adult man that's listening as well or anyone that's This is really important. Yeah. yeah. This is massive. Yeah. Yeah. So toxic masculinity is a phrase that has been thrown around a lot and- Just written it I, down. I'm just like- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. We're on. And, <laughs> and I think it's really good to have coined these terms um, because yeah. it shows, shows the progress we've made in the last 5, 10, 15 years. But- Unfortunately, sometimes these phrases now have a life of their own and they've almost gone so far to the point where we don't really know what they mean anymore or they have meant that men or boys don't want to participate anymore, which is means it's yeah. not actually moving us forward. So toxic masculinity, it's not saying that all masculinity is toxic. We're saying there are elements of masculinity that are toxic and there are elements of masculinity that are healthy. And There's when we say elements of, of feminine Feminine, that's toxic as well too. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like masculine, feminine, healthy, unhealthy, or or healthy, toxic, however you want to label it. Um, and as as we know, like toxic masculinity as a concept is more pervasive in society because of patriarchal structures, yep. because of how we got to this point of men ruling society and creating um, structures that that play into that. And that's a whole other road we could go down if we want to. <laughs> and religion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so it's like we're not throwing out masculinity. We're actually, it's like how do we help boys and men um, embrace more of their humanity? How do we get yeah. them more comfortable with the feminine parts of themselves, which they have maybe been told or um, internalised um, labels growing up that it's not a, don't be a girl, don't cry. Um, don't show any emotion, be tough. You know, you, you got to be a guy, you got to be a man, grow some balls. And he's yep. internalized yep. all these stories over years to the point where when he does start to feel emotion, and especially if he's then around his mates and he goes, Oh, it's, I'm going to be seen as weak. Or if he's around a girl who is then bringing up emotion in him because she might have a healthy relationship with her emotional experience or yep. for various other reasons, he's then potentially freaking out. He's like, there's something yeah. wrong with me. And we yeah. have to come and go, there's nothing wrong with you. We just need to repair that relationship. And so that yeah. can also damage his relationships with women as well. I'd say the third part, because um, we've gone like a, a, a long way on this one, but. <laughs> <laughs> I um, told you to jump around. It's just we're not following his script. Yeah, now. yeah. Just yeah, out there. Cool. <laughs> yeah. The third part, and the thing I love about talking about this, Greg, is that I'm still trying to work all this out for myself. I'm 30 years old yep. this year. I'm still trying to work it out myself. Um, I'm 46 and I still have got no clue, right? So, yeah. I've got, and the best thing, I've got two girls and a boy and I'm thinking, I mean, I, from, and I'm sorry, I'm coming to me off, but I say to my clients, I stuff it up and I've got 
25 years history here, right? And I still screw it up. Hmm. What chance do you guys have trying to make, as parents, trying to make the stuff through here with zero knowledge about this stuff, hmm. right? <laughs> and it's, it's difficult. Like it's, and we're, we're, still, you say, we're still going through this. We're still trying to find our way. Yeah, exactly. And, like, I'm living with my dad at the moment and he's 68. And his version of masculinity is different all again. So we're looking at intergenerational differences, which yeah. can make it hard even for a boy now who's got parents or adults around him who don't understand what it's like to, to be in his world right now. Um, yeah. Which is why we're trying to also, side topic, get the insights from boys and share them with with the public um, so we can share that more. Um, yeah. But I think the, the last bit which we're trying to do with our boys is so we sort of tier our programs to focus first on the self-awareness, the self-expression, the tools for managing their well-being, then relationships and respectful relationships and um, try and, and part of that in relation to what you're talking about with forming healthy relationships and healthy intimate relationships is um, getting them to do their own work and giving them the tools to do that, not just when they're with us but as they grow up as well. Um, and then also, you know, really basic things. What are your needs? How do you communicate your needs? How do you understand when your needs are not being met? And how do you make sure that you don't demand someone else meet your needs? Because that's also creating um, an unhealthy relationship with someone. So it's the hardest part of my job as like head of programs for the man cave is what's the one, two or three mindsets or tools that I give a boy in a program that's going to set him up for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And yeah. it's actually harder to, to work out what those three things are than it is to work out what the 20 things are. Yeah. It's difficult. And then, um, you know, you've got puberty on top of all this stuff, which, you know, testosterone is at what, 800% more than it should be. So mm. you've got all that stuff lumped on as well too so the, to the boys. So you've got hormones raging through them as well. Mm. And, you know, that's an added pressure, like you said, is that it doesn't, there's there's that and you're trying to make logical decisions and your hormones are just blowing your head off <laughs> right so yeah. it's complicated and sometimes you do forget what it was like to be a 14 15 year old boy you know when i was growing it was basically football cricket tennis golf <laughs> it was very simple yeah yeah me too me too and and um that was all about sport for me yeah cricket water polo and hockey yeah. um yeah. eat a box of shapes play some playstation <laughs> go to bed repeat the next day great fun yeah and i remember it's interesting to follow the relationships path the first few times i met girls and, and got talking to them and in a yep. private school environment i remember once or twice you know getting embarrassed about i liked a yep. girl and she didn't like me and everyone in my friendship group from, in, from both schools found out and me getting embarrassed then challenged my masculinity yeah. And, you know, the, the, another idea that's talked about is how fragile masculinity is. And I think that was one of the first times where I realised, and this still happens, where the shame of being embarrassed from a girl or a boy not liking you can then Jeez. lead to, yeah, shame in socially, which can then lead to unhealthy relationships, which then just perpetuates if it's not caught. And yep. if it's not caught where there's a space given and, you know, we're right now, we're in the context of a global pandemic and yeah. it'll be really interesting to know where we're at in 12 months' time. But, like, it's great that the government's offering psych support and counselling services and stuff, but we actually need to give boys the tools to help their relationships with each other. And yeah. that's how I think it's going to expand. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about, sorry, did I cut you off there? No, I, all good. I'm, I was done. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the fathers, missing fathers, because I I get a bit frustrated. And this is, you know, me being um, completely transparent here is that I, I get mm. parents bring their kids along and I sit the kid down and I go, mate, no wonder. Your parents are horrible. they got no idea what they're doing and your dad's missing. And I find that I'm teaching the parents more than the child a lot of the times about how to actually deal with because – what they, what they, their parents think like they're parenting an eight year old. Mm. They don't make this transition from parenting from a leadership perspective mm. to parenting and control. And they, I still see parents parenting 15 year olds controlling rather than providing a leadership 
role. And that's where it starts to go a little bit all over the place. I know they're trying to keep, keep themselves safe, but then also you've got fathers who are completely missing as well mm. too. I mean, mm. tell us about the impacts of that stuff on some of the boys you see. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't need to go on the statistics, but we do know that where there are missing fathers for, for young men, the, the, real, the outcome for them in terms of life outcomes are definitely far worse. Not good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've seen examples of this in programs, and it's it's a tricky one. I, I guess like I won't talk specifically to what it looks like for us in a program because I don't think that might yeah. be so helpful. But um, yeah. more broadly speaking, it's it's like with the parenting is you you talked about the transition they need to make, and this is one of the things I learned through through Anna's work was <laughs> that's where I got from. <laughs> yeah, great. It's like the, I think there's like the great bit I got was going, oh, okay, so. I can't just blame my teenager for for him not growing because actually I need to do the growth as well to enable his growth. Oh no, that's not convenient. That answer is not convenient for me because then I have to, then it's on me to do something about it as well. Um, yeah. And I think like as humans, psychologically, we love to externalize blame and we love to claim when we win. And so yeah. it's like, how do we take responsibility for all of it, whether it's winning or losing? Not that this is losing, but um. Yeah, one of the ideas he talks about, which um, I've, we've taken, is uh, you know, a, a, the boy will burn down the village in order to feel the heat. As a teenager, yep. he's there to push boundaries. Yep. He's trying to find himself, and he's got the testosterone yep. and adrenaline pumping through his body, which I had as well. And then also, it's the job of the elders to hold the container for him, the crucible for him, in which to explore that safely. And yes. And that's that can be really uncomfortable to to watch. Absolutely, like, where are the, where are the boundaries? And also, the ba- where the boundaries might be for your son are different to where they might be for you. And some of it, if we look at it from an attachment theory perspective, it could be that you're you're bringing back potentially old wounds or old attachment styles from what you have from how your parents brought you up. And if you haven't done the work on healing that, then you're going to put that onto your son or your kids. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like that, that transition you talked about is, you know, some of what we try to do through our work is once we do the, the work of the boys, we'll give them the skills to talk. Hey, what's the vision for the man you want to become? What are the values you want to live by? Great. Now let's communicate that to the parents so the parents can help you live into that and shift, even if it's just taking more responsibility around the house. There's something yeah. funny that, that goes on with that is where boys do want to take more responsibility. They do want to grow. But um, yeah, it can feel like sometimes their parents are holding them back because they're they're having to grow themselves, and it's starting. It's really starting the letting go journey. As boys go from twelve to thirteen, they've gone from being, you know, beautiful boys that are that are really connected to their parents and their family, to now actually, what's more important is how they're seen in their group of mates. Yeah, and um, yeah, just a parent being available and and him knowing that he can go talk to you no matter what. That yep. is really important. So, um, yeah, it's it's hard when you have a missing a missing dad, and I think if it's possible, that's really when best friends or uncles really become important in in being role models. It doesn't have to be the dad, or it could even be a, yeah. a sports coach as well. Yeah, I, mean, I was I remember when I was playing footy. Um, I was lucky I played golf at the same time, and we used to actually play with a. Um, you know, we used to go and play under under seventeens in the morning, and then go and play golf at you know quarter to twelve because mm. um, we could at that stage because you're allowed to do it now. I'd collapse, right? So, um, but we had this group of guys at the golf club that would pair up with us. So it'd be two boys and two guys, right? And that was brilliant, and that was some of the best things I think the golf club did was by actually made sure that we didn't all four of us didn't play together. They paired us up with adults which was great from a perspective of having that role model as well too because you didn't muck around the golf course. They pulled you in a line. They, If you threw your club, they'd be having a crack at you and stuff like that, whereas the four boys played together. There was clubs being thrown everywhere across the golf course. Right? <laughs> so, so there's, you know, there's things like that that were, you know, they're, they're invaluable in that way. But um, I'm really mm. interested about rites of passage, and I think you're spot on the money about the missing link at, 14, 15, that there is no rites of passage for, for boys to actually 
mark that they're actually not a child anymore. And, and mm. for me, the penny dropped when, when I when I did that. Um, went out to Byron and did that course, and and was like, absolutely, this is this is just so important for young men to be able to share that with their fathers as well too, or some other role model in their life to have that significance of now you're a young man and a rite of passage. Mm. Tell us about, you know, from your perspective, how important rites of passages are. Mm. Oh, how good the rite of passage work? Like, <laughs> it's um, brilliant. Yeah. And and just, guys a freak. Literally is a freak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anna's amazing. And, and it's just, I think what's so beautiful about the rites of passage work before I go into it is it's thousands of years of wisdom that Indigenous tribes from around the world have used to manage their 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 families, their their groups, their 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 societies, and I just I like for me, I'm always looking for the thing that cuts across society and culture. It's like how do we yeah. what's the bit? And the rite of passage is, is one of those things, or the hero's journey, whatever you want to call it, that just creates a great framework for showing the natural evolution, the natural birth and death and regrowth cycle that is inevitable and is actually you you resist it at your peril. Um, yeah. So I just I just love it, and um, when when I discovered it with Anna, yeah, it was um, it was a, it was something I've been looking for, but I didn't know what it looked like. So yeah, um, yeah, with the boys, um, I mean, around that age of 15, 14, 15, 16 is um, there's been quite a bit of research done around it, and shows that that's when um, depression, suicidal idea, suicide ide- ideation, um, and other issues get worse. And, um, you know, there's a few different reasons for that. Um, the, main, the main bit really is, you know, things are starting to change in terms of their potential sexual relationships. Um, that's sort of the age where they're starting to think about who they are or who they want to become as well. And as you said, they're starting to move into more of wanting to be an adult and find their independence. Yeah. And yeah. Um, without that, they defer to the stereotype. And so if there's not someone that's there talking to them about who they want to become, and we think they already have it and they already know it, it's just that there's a, yeah. a bit of work to pull the layers back, um, then they will defer to the stereotype or they'll defer to um, role models that potentially aren't healthy for them as well, which is your example of the, the guys you play golf with. It's just so beautiful. And I grew up, you know, scuba diving and being around my dad's mates who I just, or, or they were all just uncles to me. And I was young enough yeah. to think they were actually my uncles, even though they weren't. But um, the mass- massive in terms of what they did to me, in terms of just showing discipline and really asking me questions and and you know sharing sharing their journey along the way. So I think that that it's like missing code of honor, honor, isn't it? It's like, it's yeah, like yeah, code of honor. Yeah, it is. And I think like one of the broader things that I'm seeing with this is like previously, you know, for, for hundreds of years before we had the internet you actually relied on your elders to get knowledge and wisdom about how to live. And the the challenging bit we've seen now is um, I don't need you as an adult or an elder in my life to get knowledge about anything because I can go to the internet and get it. And so I think this is where some of the intergenerational disconnect has happened in what adults would say are young people are very disrespectful these days. And I'd say to an extent that's, that's true. I wouldn't say it's because they want to be disrespectful, but I think, they're challenging more and they want more and they're, they're also not that happy with how things have gone. Um, and we need that intergenerational relationships to continue because there's obviously it works both ways. You get the enthusiasm and zest of the young people and you get the wisdom and knowledge and life experience of the older people. Um, but I think that, that explains some of the disconnects that's there. Um, the rite of passage part, it's like I think the, first, the last thing I want to say about that is that's just like one of the first ones. That's one of the first ones where a teenage boy starts to, you know, he, he needs that space to safely explore it. And so we've had, um, you know, families in our lives reach out to us and ask us how can they do it with their children or how can they just mark a significant moment. Uh, your son finishing high school, um, him graduating from his TAFE or his university degree, those are, that's another rite of passage, another rite of passage. It's another, it's another yeah. opportunity for him to redefine who he is because all it is is it's a container for growth. And you'd know from all the work yep. you've done as well is you're just creating the container for growth around something contextual that means that, you know, if you don't do it, you're probably going to be pretty agitated and frustrated. And 
that's yeah. often one of the first signs that you're ready to to shift and, and shed another layer. Um, yeah, yeah. But we just we just need to do it for boys, and it it's yeah, it can be hard um, when there's that intergenerational disconnection and that feeling of disrespect. So I think that's another area we need to to repair and focus on as well. I mean, I remember going through school and and there was this the pressure to be who do you want to be when you grow up and it was all around pilot doctor lawyer blah 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 and this identification with identity about that your success came from either the job you did the clothes you wear the bank balance you had um and that was very much you know from what i knew back then that was success was based on these things and and that's where you know i've seen people my age now the results of that kind of upbringing around identity and success being an external validation causing where guys in my (laughs) generation in their 40s having complete breakdowns because they've Mm -hmm. got to where they thought they should have been in life and it's completely unhappy I mean, how do you redefine success for boys these days that don't make an external validation or based on material or how many jet skis you own? <laughs> yeah, and I think um, how do we do that? Such a good question. <laughs> um, the when you were talking, it came back to me. One of the core ideas around a rite of passage slash any growth or transformation process is what's the identity you're shifting into? Because sometimes when we talk about this, it's like, well, what are you actually changing? What are you actually yeah. teaching? Are you are you trying to teach boys how to earn half a million dollars by their age of 30 or are you teaching them how to have character and respect? And that's a little harder to to understand how to progress towards. Yeah. And um so I think it's 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 also that you know that what we are asking of our young men and who we want them to become has shifted because the needs of our community has shifted and yeah. the expectations that we now have of our men has shifted in a really positive way but right now in the last five years 10 years at least it's quite a confusing time to be a guy to understand yeah. okay so i know i've got to be strong and um decisive and that's what it means to be a man and you know make decisions and i've got to know what career i have and what my purpose is oh, and i've also got to show no emotion and and be tough and, and all the um, stuff that comes with that and then i'm also being told to open up, be vulnerable, talk about my emotions, you know, cry in front of my friends and, and family. And it's it's actually, there's a, there's a shifting of gender roles that we're seeing. And then we're yeah. also talking a lot more prevalence of non people that are opting to be non-binary and, yeah. um, you know, way more liberation and space for people that are from the LGBTQI plus community. There's a lot of moving parts right now that, for even just for a boy that's like, I just want to be a guy, he's like, is that still allowed? Is that still okay? Yeah. And what parts of that aren't okay and what parts of that are okay? Um, and it's really like how do you create the space to ask questions for a boy for him to discover that for himself as opposed to trying to put that in his head? Um, and how do we create a space for boys? And when I say space, I'm talking about like not just in a workshop but in conversations over the dinner table in conversations in the car, that sort of thing, where if he says something that is, let's say, wrong, um, how do we ensure that we then have a conversation with him and explore with him about why that might be wrong so that he then gets the tools for self-awareness building? So if he says something that might be seen as disrespectful towards a woman, rather than him getting um, his, you know, his head metaphorically cut off in that moment from a person around him, being patient with him and then going, okay, well, how do we talk about that? And then give you the skills. So. Maybe you got a bit lost from your original question, but it no, feels like that stuff was important to it's contribute. A, it is. It's a minefield because I, I totally agree. You've got these constructs about masculinity where it's completely confusing, completely, because especially as they get older, you know, you've got when they start dating, you want women who who want the the leader and the ones who takes control. When you got these old um, dance between things about. The female doesn't want to be the masculine, but the she wants the male to be the masculine, wants to have these certain attributes. But then other points you're saying to- masculinity is toxic and you can't do this, you're going to be more like this and more gentle. And then mm-hmm. they can become more gentle, become more softer, but then there's no attraction there from the female because they don't want the 
the feminine into the uh, it's it's a minefield. It's a complete. <laughs> it's like I would hate to be a fourteen year old boy right now. And then yeah. you've got and this is political, and I'm hearing all there on this stuff. But then you've got critical race theory and um, the thing about you know if you're white and you're male, you're privileged. Um, and you've got that jumped on top as well, too, that, you know, you're automatically going to apologise for things. And it's just like, wow, look at the stress and pressure these kids are on these days. And I think you're doing a great job. But I think part of what you're doing is really simplifying things for them, which mm. is an amazing thing to just get them back to basics about core stuff, about, no, this is this is what it means to be a, a male today in today's society and you contribute in the way that goes across these different genres as well, too. I mean, I, I interviewed a um, young girl called Olivia who went through, um, you know, she on a previous podcast a while ago, and she she used to be a boy and and she's trans transitioned to a girl now. And that was an amazing story about I didn't know what they actually had to go through from a psychology perspective to actually even make that change as a teenager. And my God, some of the so stress is on top of that stuff as well, too. And you know, non-binary and mm. wow. <laughs> so <laughs> no, the, the great thing is that I think you're really simplifying it for, for, for boys these days. And that's that takes talent mm. and a clear messaging because, like you said, you've done the work and you've been through it. And it's, it gives them that safety that they can actually just step into a place that's not confusing and they can mm. they can have, hold that stuff. Let's talk about yeah. values. I mean, that's something there that when I work with people, when I mention values, people kind of look at me blankly and kind of go, what are you talking about? And I said, well, that's the yeah. core of your being, right? Yeah. Um, do you find sometimes that that's confusing for boys or, or parents? They just don't know what values that they should have or do hold or, you know, have, in, have as far as structures in the family unit? Mm -hmm. Oh, that last little bit you added in was just another extra layer on top of that question. That was great. <laughs> um, so, well, I, I think uh, the way we try and approach the values conversation with boys is um, what are the questions we can ask to help them elicit values without telling them that's their values that we're talking about? Yeah. And yep. so often we'll take them through a, a visualisation of just they meet themselves in seven years' time. What's the kind of man yep. they meet? Or we'll show them a video of, you know, Matthew McConaughey talking at the Oscars about his hero, which is himself in 10 years' time. I've seen and, that. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And we'll, we'll, we'll use that sort of thing to go, great, so what, who's the man you want to meet in 10 years' time? And then um, they've generally speaking, apart from the occasional jokes that says he wants to be a professional skateboarder or gamer, most boys <laughs> get it. They just go, Oh, I've been waiting, and and the the power in them then expressing it in front of their community is is all part of the community um, seeing and acknowledging what they're the stake they're putting in the ground, and, and them talking about the kind of person yeah. they want to become. Um, so I I personally think values are pretty innate, um, but as you said, culturally they can be different, or they can at least have different language around it, um, yeah. and the family dynamic can impact that. And inevitably, at some point, there's a chance that a boy will outgrow or want to move away from the family values that he has inherited as he becomes his own person as well. Um, yeah. And the most important thing, I think, with values is how do you make it practical? Like how do you – we've got our values framework at the Man Cave um, and the three values for us are care, challenge and choice. And we imagine that as a yin and yang symbol where you've got care on one side, challenge on the other, and choice down the middle. And really when it comes down to it, care is effectively the healthy feminine and challenge is the healthy masculine in very simple yeah. terms. And choice is where well, you, you still have to choose. You still get to choose as well. And the, the behaviours that are under that are the thing that bring it to life. Putting humanity first is one of the behaviours. Take the shot, have a crack, um, be a springboard for someone else. Yep. These are the really basic things. And then the last tagline for the man cave is well, what's best for the boys. When when you're doing anything in your work day, in a workshop, um, you know, it goes all the way from a facilitator up to our CEO. Are you doing what's best for the boys or what is best for the boys? And that's really tapping into an element of service and, and broader purpose. And I think like when it comes to values for boys, it's like how do you give them behaviours that they can use in their everyday life? taps into a value that they can then grow into 
And then yep. how do you get them to generate it so that um, if they don't live up to it, it's them not living up to their own word as opposed to them yep. not living up to your word and your expectations of, of him. And that's when you start to, to get places, I think, as opposed to projecting or putting expectations onto him is helping him elicit it out and then come into agreements about how you can support him. Awesome. Very well put. Excellent. So drugs and alcohol. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so much more prevalent than I was when I was a boy. Um, I, think, I think when I was growing up, the worst thing you did was, you know, uh, you know, a few beers and, you know, nick some cigarettes. And then you, you were literally the, you know, the rebel uh, amongst mm. the group, right? It ain't the way today. It's a completely different ball game. Um, and things are so much more prevalent as well these days, especially, you know, those who know how to get around the dark web stuff. So, mm. um, you know, how, how do you sort of deal with the uh, that sort of, and that's sort of a rite of passage as well too, you know, mm. kids at 15, you know, going on a path of of testing, you know, uh, substances, and I can't, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I've done my fair share of stuff that goes down my throat, up my nose, and into my veins. So, you know, um, I've been there, done that. Um, how, how do you sort of get around that stuff, uh, that conversation? Because for the majority of kids these days, it's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. I think it comes back to, to two parts. <laughs> if you're like, this is a good question. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes with this. Um, I've had my own experience with, with drugs and alcohol as well. Uh, um, and oh, I'm not going to go down that path just right now because it might sidetrack us from, from talking about the boys. But um, uh, the, the two bits are, well, the, probably the main bit is how do, you, how do we help a boy make responsible decisions in the moment? And how do we yep. help him work out that, he's he's there's multiple data points in within which he's making the decision and he's probably making the decision sometimes based on peer pressure in a neg in a negative way peer pressure in a negative way how do i how yeah. do i do this so that i you know can be cool or don't don't make sure that i still fit in with the group and that's what a lot of it comes back to how amazing would it be if you had the experience of say 15 16 year old boys experimenting with these things they've done some of this work and one of them says, oh, I don't want to take it tonight. I, I've got an important game tomorrow. I don't feel like it's night. And his mates go, yeah, cool. Fair enough, man. No worries. And they respect his decision. That would be amazing. It would be amazing. Yeah. And I, I would I would love to think that it's already happening as well. Um, and then, yeah. you know, the fact that he's making that decision is the other part based on his values, based on the kind of man he wants to become, not just in 10 years' time, but tomorrow. And yep. he's sticking to that. And then he's got mates that respect his decision in, in following that as well. Because we talk about peer pressure in a negative way, but there's also another way of thinking about it, which is peer pressure can be really positive. If he's uh, hanging out with, yeah, if he's hanging out with um, with his mates that are pushing him in the right ways, then he's going to go do things. And if they support that, then even better. Um, but, you know, we're talking, the tide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, I think about like my teen years, I, I played a lot of hockey and I had to, you know, have some nights where I went to house parties and I went home early and um, it kind of sucked at the time, but I was so dedicated to hockey that I didn't worry me too much. Um, I think the other, the other bit that's challenging within this is boys are experimenting with the boundaries, but also, you know, sometimes they're just in situations potentially right now as well where being in their body is really uncomfortable. And a lot of, I think, when yeah. we talk about the work with doing your work is like, what's your relationship like with yourself? And sometimes this drugs and alcohol comes from thrill-seeking and being the guy, but other times it also comes from a boy just wanting to escape. He's like, I just don't want to have yeah. to feel the, the crap that I'm feeling right now. And I'm sorry to say it, but us adults do the same thing. Um, <laughs> so... Right. It's like my mum, my mum and dad, both when I was um, a teenager, um, I mean, they occasionally bought me alcohol. They didn't realise that I was also getting it from mates on the side because that wasn't enough for me. But, um, you know, they were, they were happy to have conversations with me about it and what it means responsibly and 
mum would constantly remind me of the the dangers of of drinking alcohol and how it would damage my brain and look to be honest with you that didn't really I didn't really care about it when I was that age I just wanted I just wanted to have a few drinks and feel that that rush of carelessness of care being carefree and having fun and I think um a lot of it comes back to like how do we help boys make responsible decisions and then when they screw up or if they screw up how do we help them work through the consequences of their actions and decisions as well um yeah that'd be the the way they're trying to navigate it maybe that's a more politically correct answer but yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i mean look for me it's like i i, I look back and think I, I and this it's this is horrible to say, but I, I'm so glad the experiences I had and, and the path that I took because it's led me to exactly where I am now. Mm. And those were very valuable experiences, but I did some horrible things, you know, and some carnage behind that um those points. But um but you know, it has led me to here as well too. But anyway, um failure. Yeah. How how do we because you mentioned before about pushing boundaries and providing a safe space for them and providing that place and and failure is a very, very big part is that, you know, it's it's sort of shame and when someone fails at something and it's wrong and that you're, you're a complete failure, you're no good, you're not enough and all that kind of stuff. And how do we reinforce mm-hmm. with our teenagers to healthily and see the bigger picture with what we would technical, technically call failure? And I, I don't think the word failure is actually... I've got a different meaning to the word failure completely than most people have. How do we instill that different meaning of the word failure into into the into the heads of our young boys that you can stuff up and you're meant to stuff up? Mm. Well, I, can I ask you what your definition of failure is first? Because now I'm interested. Uh, it's, your, it's your ability to to grow from your uh, shadow or your experience there that shows mm. you. Um, things about either where you're at, your internal dialogue, or just an experience itself that doesn't go the way you expect it to. Mm. And it's about what can you grow from it? How can you learn from this? How can you actually become a better person from this? And as and, and you know, it's my spiritual side is you're you're a, you're a contrast of light and dark. You need to play with the dark to know the light, and the light can't exist without the dark. So you got to play in that field. And you need to embrace that side of you. So and that's what we talked about before about the shadow work and you know the dark night of the soul kind of stuff. And and a lot of people would see that stuff as failures. And for me, it's very much about well, what are you learning through this? What has that shown you? What have who have you become because of that experience and that mistake you did? Uh, and as long as you learn from it and you see the growth from it, then it's not a failure. It never will be. Mm-hmm. If you keep doing it again and again and again, <laughs> it might be something different. But for me, it's definitely a time that you can sort of take stock about how you grow as an individual and a human being and how you can, you know, again, come back to you, your true source of who you truly are, which is infinite love. Mm. So, but you need to know infinite love through the light and the dark, right? So a bit of a convoluted mm. answer, but that's, yeah. No, it's awesome. <laughs> that's my not straightforward answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I think you're like you're talking about the relationship we have with ourselves, and that's not always the simplest answer as well. So, <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I love what you said. I think the the like the bit for me is what's your relationship with failure internally as well. And I, I hate to harp on about this, but if you're a parent and you're listening to this, you're an adult and you're with young people. What's your own relationship with failure? And my relationship with failure is if I screw up or I um, don't get it right and I'm not perfect, which is a big part of me. I'm, I'm just like want everything to be perfect and everything needs to be yeah. to high performance or I'm a failure is how do we, how do I then make that not about me being a bad person because failing can often so often be connected to identity. And it's like, let's just split those things apart. And then when we talk and we'll, we'll do this with the boys. And I think this is really like an really important part is, how do we work with young men and people in general to help them realize they are pure love, they are pure spirit, and when they stuff up, they're not judging themselves for stuffing up, but they're seeing that as the opportunity to learn. And then they're not seeing that as part of their identity. They're still coming back to the core parts of them that are whether it's their values or um, you know their beliefs. And 
um, recognizing that that's all occurring within a human body that is designed to scan for fear, sorry, scan for threats, and his fear is like literally in a fear loop because that's how we survive. And so, yep. yeah, exactly. And, you know, we talk about the fight, flight, freeze response, the amygdala hijack is if we fail, we're looking at that as a potentially, our brain is looking at that as a, as, as a potential threat to our existence. And yep. so slowing down and recognising that it's okay, maybe we stuffed up on stage in front of 100 people, maybe we didn't score the winning goal in the final, Um you're not going to be socially outcast and it might feel like you are. How do you help a young person go through that, that process? And I think a lot of it comes back to how can we help young people come back to what they can control um, and, and then how do they start there again? And, you know, we are, again, talking about this in the context of an arena of a high school where, you know, if you do stuff up in front of 100 people or you miss the, the goal that's the talk of school the next day maybe for the next week and so it can be really challenging um but giving the the boys some of these skills can be really important because otherwise they might say that that and maybe they maybe they are a good guy so to speak and they don't get the girl they like and then they they believe and this is something that i had to work through that good guys finish last yeah and I guarantee you, there are a few people listening to this right now that still probably believe that. There are parts of me, there are parts of me that still believe that's true as well. And there were parts when I was eighteen, I'm like, well, why am I good? Why am I a good guy? I mean, it doesn't work. It feels like the girls I like are still going for the guy that's mean to them. And so, just like again, for a young person, like, okay, let's just slow down. <laughs> let's come back to your your core your core values and recognize. It's a pretty it's a pretty tough time for you right now. You're still finding yourself. Um, and giving them again that safe space to explore all this within your presence. And I'm talking, I'm saying that because I think we're mainly talking to an adult audience here about how do they how do they create that? And um, yeah, being prepared as an adult with a young man in your life to look at your own relationship with all the things that we're talking about. Because inevitably there's going to be times when the young person in your life pushes you for answers or with their perspectives yep. and potentially triggers your own reaction with that same thing. And like, that's a great opportunity to then do the work on that and understand why that's coming up for you. Um, yeah. So I think uh, to like try and sum it off, it's like, how do we make sure that we don't make failure? Failure is not connected to identity. doesn't mean you're a bad person. Yeah. And then yeah. how do we cultivate a really healthy relationship while acknowledging the context that a young person is existing in is really challenging. My dream is like, how do we give, I would I, just the image I have in my head when a boy leaves a man cave program or just with a young person is no matter where he goes or what he does for the next 20, 30, 40 years, we've given him some core tools that he can use in the way that he relates to himself and relates to the world. And he does that in a healthy and loving way. And if we did that with thousands of boys, then hopefully, you know, we'll change, we'll change the world slowly one bit at a time. Man, that's a great way to end. I was about to say we've probably got <coughs> running out of time here because, you know, we could talk. Literally, I could go for another two hours and I'll, I'll get you on again because there's going to be a lot of questions that come from this. I can guarantee it, right? Yeah. Um, what's what's Man Cave going on? What are the programs for the people who are listening? Um, what's coming up for you guys? Even though we're in lockdown, there's obviously some online stuff you can do. You can send me some links. We're going to put them in the, in the bios below as to what to get a hold of Matt, to get a hold of Man Cave. Um, to reach out to those guys. But what's some of the things you're doing right now that the guys can actually tackle or coming up later this year? Mm, yeah, great. Um, we've just launched a podcast ourselves, um, two podcasts. Um, the first one's called Outside the Cave, which is having conversations with public figures and influencers about the stuff we talk about inside Man Cave workshops usually. Um, the first one's with Harry Garside, the Olympic boxer, about his path with masculinity. I know his um, mum. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, no, I so I, I used to do um used to there's a um used to do my mediumship. So um so uh Kate used to be in the same class as, as me. So, Amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> it's a tearjerker, that podcast. He Harry talks opens up about his relationship with his with his brother, um, with his family and how much they mean to him. And I mean, if you want more of Man Cave and you want to sort of understand what we're trying to messages we're trying to get out listening to that podcast um would be a good place to start as well 
Um, Literally, like seriously, that is, I'll put a link into that because the kid is a phenomenal kid. Yeah, he is. He is. Yeah. And there's another one on there with Maria Thetil, who's Miss Universe Australia representative that got recently added to a WhatsApp group um, with a bunch of boys from her old high school. And they were pushing a bunch of misogynistic messages directly to her in that WhatsApp group. She's since been on the news and and spoken um, out and we've actually partnered with her to go and work with the school that those boys came from. And that conversation she has with our head of community is amazing in terms of educating yourself around the all the nuances of gender, sex, masculinity, relationships. That's just hits hits heavy. Um, there's also Inside the Cave, which is another podcast that features what's actually happening inside Man Cave and gets people from inside us to talk about the inner workings. Um, we, If people want to do training with us, uh, there's educators that are listening that want to actually learn how to work better with boys. We have the Man Cave Academy, which they can get access to online. And um, we're also a charity. So if anyone's running any events and they want to contribute to a mental health charity that's working with teenage boys, right now we are running online wellbeing circles, holding space for boys on Zoom calls. We are connecting with them through gaming. We're gaming with them on Twitch. We're doing check-ins. We're role modeling the stuff we're talking about on the platforms they're at. If you want to donate or raise money for us, then that's where it will go. Um, and the last thing is uh, the brand stuff, the hygiene brand. Man Cave is a majority shareholder in that. And for every thousand dollars of sales with stuff, they'll fund a boy to go through one of our programs. And um, yeah, if you if you want to buy that for yourself or for your teenage boys, it's also then got really healthy messaging around masculinity. So um, that would be the other the other way that people can help. Cool. Well, we'll put the links in uh, in the bio so people that want to reach out, they can actually do that. And look, seriously, highly, highly recommend you know what these guys are doing. If you've got any second doubt, ping me, and, and I will <laughs> literally sing their praises because you know you come across some programs in life and. You know, for me, I am so far behind this uh, and what, what Matt and the team are doing um, to try and help young men and their parents and their families. And, and it's really about, you know, creating a, a family unit going forward in life that's actually respectful, loving, caring, honest. And it's just, it's just this heartfelt place of creating these amazing connections with people um, socially and, and and in the family, and Matt, I think you're just doing an amazing job, and and you are a gift of God, mate. So, you know, um, someone's put you on this planet here for a reason, and we're lucky to have you at this time. Let's just say that, uh, and you and the guys there, and the girls that that are part of Man Cave, um, just yeah, it's the old Blues Brothers. You know, you're on a mission from God. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Thanks, Craig. Um, and look, I just, yeah, half out. Thanks, thanks for being on this. Um, I'm going to get a lot of comments about this. So, um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, please reach out, guys, if you're listening to this. Um, subscribe to the Man Cake podcast. Um, you can subscribe to my my podcast down here and just reach any time. But, uh, Matt, thanks for joining us and uh, looking forward to having you on again, though. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, really enjoyed our conversation and I'm looking forward to hearing what your listeners think of it as well. Cool. All right, guys, so that's it for um, Matt and myself and uh, interviewing the Man Cave. And, again, if you want to hear any conversations of this, um, please, if you want to hear more stuff, comment below, reach out to us if you like this. Just ask for more and we'll get Matt back on again. If you've got some questions, ping me, ping Matt. <laughs> we, we, can all, we can actually add to this, right, because they're getting the news out there and getting things like that are, are really important. So, and if this has helped you, or if you got any concerns or has triggered you, again, reach out to us or reach out to Beyond Blue or or Lifeline, um, and you know they can help as well too. So if this has triggered anything inside of you, just remember that there are facilities out there that can help you immediately with this stuff. So, but um, that's enough for, for myself and for Matt today, and we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks, guys. Thank you.